Good afternoon, everyone. If you're on, I'm Alex. I'm the co-founder of TechTO. I'm an operator with two exits. I've, and if you don't know me, I've also done professional services. I'm an active investor as the head of Canada for AngelList and a partner at N49P. Um, if you're joining us from the East Coast, appreciate you spending lunch with us. If you're joining us from the West Coast, I hope you have a coffee to start the day. Um, we welcome you all here. Uh, the idea behind Founders and Funding is to help demystify the fundraising process and the relationship between investors and founders. What we really want to get into is making sure we go beyond what you read in the blogs or here in Clubhouse and hear what it's like to build a story, I mean, to build a company, to, to get, get investors, and then build something that lasts and is sustainable. And today I'm really excited to feature uh, Michelle from Stand Up Ventures and Stephanie from Teal Book. I think you'll find her story inspiring and you know, you've know you got very, two very transparent guests. But before we get started, there's some rules of the show. Um, if you haven't found it yet, there's a chat on, your, on the side of your screen. Go ahead and introduce yourself and let us know where you're joining us from. So let us know. I've mentioned Toronto and the West, or the West Coast. If you're in the Atlantic provinces or in the prairies, Make sure we know and make sure we I do a shout out to you next time. Also, put questions on the Q&A tab on the right. Uh, I like to weed them into the conversation. I have some questions. We'll, we'll talk, but it's good to, um, to know what you're thinking. Um, next thing, there's this thing called this emoji cannon, I think, over there as well. I don't know what emojis Liz has put in there for today, so why don't you go try them out. Show us, like, give us some virtual applause. Use it throughout the show to tell us what you love, what you hated, or whatever other emojis that Liz has put in there. And then finally, uh, stay after the main event. Oh, uh, for for, uh, for the to basically network with the community. Um, Liz just told me there's lots of laughing faces and blue hearts, so I appreciate that. But again, this, after we get through the main uh, fireside, you want to stick around, meet some other founders, meet some more people from the community, we're going to have networking. And finally, most importantly, please share on social media using the hashtag TechTO. Don't, just don't push TechTO into Twitter or LinkedIn. Um, put some nuggets of wisdom you've heard and quote. Yeah, there it is, hashtag TechTO. Before we get started, uh, I would like uh, to get Anna from uh, FastSpring. Hey. Hey, how's it going? Pretty good. So good. we couldn't we could do this without FastSpring because they make they help pay the bills. And, <laughs> and, they, and you guys actually have a really cool product. Why don't you tell us about it? Yeah, so FastSpring is everything you kind of need to sell, especially software globally. Um, so that's where exactly FastSpring comes to play. It's an e-commerce platform that makes selling internationally so much easier. So we cover all things global payments. We'll make it very easy for currency conversions, help you with your taxes. Essentially just takes so much time off of your plate so then you can end up selling more. And a part of selling software, um, especially through subscription-based modeling, is where FastSpring thrives. And so that's why today I'm going to share a link coming up soon to talk about how exactly subscription revenue works, how you can become an expert in it, and grow your business so much better. Thanks, Anna. That, you know, maybe in the future episode, I'd love to hear a couple like case studies on Canadians that you've helped out, because I'm sure there's a few Canadian startups or large tech companies in your client yeah, base. Definitely. I will make sure to come back next founder funding with a bunch of case studies and we'll give some great examples. Awesome. Thanks so much, Anna. Um, now I'd like to get to the conversation, the main part of the show. I'd love to get Michelle and Stephanie on stage. Oh, here we go. That was quick. Um, so thank you both for joining me. Both of you are super busy. Um, Stephanie, I know you're in the middle of scaling a business. So I really appreciate your time. Let's start off with the basics. Uh, let's start with Stephanie. Explain your background before you started Tealbook. Like, what, what's your history? You didn't just wake up one morning and start Tealbook, did you? Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, and that's typically when I explain what Tealbook does, people are like, how did you end up in this? Because looking way back, I would have seen myself more in fashion or advertising or something like that. Um, but anyway, I started to... Um, my career was a little interesting. I worked in startup and then I worked for a data company and I also worked for a pharmaceutical company um, and, and had the opportunity to kind of put pieces together to see that when you're in an enterprise and you're looking to uh, compete, you need innovation. And so I started a company about 14 years ago called Matchbook and the focus of that business was to help 
large enterprise, who were facing challenges to find innovation and innovation came through suppliers, companies who were already solving challenges, who were building solutions or bringing companies together to build a specific solution for that customer. And that translated um, very well into this function of procurement called strategic sourcing that was really there to bridge the gap between what procurement was trying to achieve and what the business goals were. And so my firm started helping establish strategic sourcing as a function. Um, and then a lot of my contacts went to hyper growth companies that were growing quite fast. And my friends who were executive in those companies start reaching out and say, we need, you know, this service, we need these products, can you help? And then I start seeing that it was a very similar roadmap to launching a first commercial asset with these fast growing companies and start shifting my consulting business to build procurement function for early stage companies that were not the traditional procurement and how you think of procurement to be a roadblock and sort of process driven, but change the notion to have procurement in a way that it's scalable, enabling and gives the organization transparency on spend as the company scales really, really fast. So that was my background that's put me um, in the forefront of the challenge of the procurement function and having that transparency, that enablement came from lack of having access to good supplier information across systems and people. And that's what I aim to solve. Cool. I think there's a lot I want to unpack there, but before that, I want to get Michelle to introduce yourself. Michelle, explain who you are and give us like your, your quick background too. Hi. Thanks for having us today, Alex. This is this is fun and I always enjoy seeing everyone and I feel like it's it's a way to to connect in this crazy time. So so appreciate all the work tech to yoga. Um, so my name is Michelle McBain. I'm a seed stage investor. Uh, and I manage a fund called Stand Up Ventures. Um, Stand Up invests in uh, high growth ventures in uh, BB software, digital health that are led or co-led and founded by women. And so we call the fund Stand Up when we launched after the little girl standing up to the bull on Wall Street, which she's, she's curious and confident and courageous and she's everything you look for in founders. Um, but we also realized there was incredible founders out there like Stephanie, um, who sometimes uh, didn't get the attention they should have gotten from from uh, from from investors um, because they didn't always see what we saw in a founder, uh, the traits that we believe make for a super successful founder. And happy to chat about that at, at length a little bit further. So, so um, a couple things, mm -hmm. Liz, if you can find a picture of that, uh, the, the statue with the bull and the girl, I would love mm -hmm. to put it in the chat. Um, and second of all, I love these intros because usually you get the you know the intros and there's not a lot to unpack, but both of you have intros I have to unpack a bit. So mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll flip it back and forth over here. So Stephanie, um, you know, you went through your background quite quickly, but <laughs> what I heard here was a couple of things. Your folk, you know, you start you know when you were doing consulting, you started you were doing strategic sourcing. So for people that don't understand procurement or strategic sourcing, what is that? Because I think it's important to understand when we mm -hmm. get into Teal book what those are. So can you just for people that may have not been from that space, can you explain what those are? Well, if you're selling to an enterprise, you should know or you should get to know procurement um, because it's typically the function that um, controls all spend that are procurable. And so if, if an enterprise is spending money on services or software or um, any direct material, the business typically will drive the decision, but it will always go through procurement, either through a contract, through uh, the relationship with the organization. They're going to be the one who are going to challenge the business to get more bids. Uh, they put processes in place to make sure that they're getting the most value. So they're going to be the ones uh, typically negotiating. Um, and so uh, it's a pretty important function. If you're thinking, if you're a founder and you're looking at your business and how you're going to scale your business and hire more people, if you don't put guardrails and processes and technology to help with your spend, even for us right now, we just raised a lot of money. We went from 30 to 53 employees in six weeks. Um, it's very easy for employees to make mistakes and start buying things that they shouldn't be buying. And that can go really quickly, especially data. And so having guidelines, processes, typically this is procurement and larger companies who spend more money will have a dedicated procurement function. So, and, and you were saying that you were consulting companies on strategic sourcing and you started to see this opportunity to actually create what became Tealbook. So when did you realize there was an opportunity? What convinced you that, hey, I can go from consulting to actually having a marketplace or workflow software? 
it took nine years um, because I have a successful consulting business, three kids. I don't, I've got great work-life balance. I didn't feel like I needed to change the world of procurement, but um, when something is in your face all the time and every customer I worked with, I was like, if they had this platform, it would solve all of the things that they're challenged with. And I saw this entire industry really quickly migrating to software as a way to fix data. And I just didn't buy into it. And I was seeing this that at some point it was going to hit a wall because, and that wall happened with COVID. But um, yeah, I just, it was too much in my face to not do anything about it. And I was looking for solution for my customers and I couldn't find it. And I remember I was working with this very large biotech company in San Francisco. And I'm looking, we're talking about the same problem. And I'm, I'm looking across the highway, there's uh, SAP and there's Facebook and there's LinkedIn and there's Salesforce and all these other companies that are really focused on enabling information. And there's this biotech company, this gi gigantic biotech company who's um, inhibited, paralyzed, frankly, in some of the decisions that they, they're making because this information is not readily available uh, across the organization. So, so I love this. This basically, you're, you, you were in this area, you saw this problem that was not being solved and it basically pulled you. You knew, this, you knew there was demand there, you knew there was a problem that needed to be solved. And, and so you, how long ago did you start Tealbook? Depends. <laughs> Between us and a few people on here. Customers is six years, investors is four. Yeah. Um, you know, I started from the room next to here on my own, um, the really, really, really hard way. And I suggest to not go that route of starting a company by yourself with no investment, no team, no technology background. Um, so it, it was a two years of, of building an MVP with a consulting firm and then proving out that customers were looking for a solution and getting enough customers to be able to then attract a team and then attract capital. And so I definitely bootstrap. I did get some angel money earlier on, but um, definitely the hard, the hard route to build a company. Four years ago is when Michelle invested. That's when uh, I had my CTO. We start rebuilding the technology stack, machine learning native, start using big data. Like Tailbook in its format today is really four years old, but I had two years of you know, of really, it's all hard work, but that was like, you know, inhuman kind of hard work. <laughs> so I want to, uh, you know, I, I love this because it's, here's an opportunity you saw, and then you basically de-risked a bit by doing it on the side. And I, I can imagine, you said you have work-life balance. I don't know how you had any balance. I had none. No, I, no, I don't, I, 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 I recovered that a little bit with COVID, but. Okay. Uh, and then I imagine COVID is an important part of the story. And Michelle's just messaged me saying, hey, we should talk about it. I want to get to that, but I want to go a bit chronological because I think you mentioned one thing there where you brought me, you, you met Michelle, I guess, two years into this journey. So Michelle, I'd love to just back up a bit. And so first of all, you said, and I, you know, I think Liz has put the link to that, to the girl from the, the Stand Up Ventures is named after. But what is, yes. you know, what is, just take a big step back because you've been in venture for a while. And why do you think venture in general is not appreciated or what is underappreciated about women founders or women leaders? And what and what and what's that what's a competitive advantage that you can look for and then find great people like Stephanie to invest in? Yeah. So that's that's a, a fabulous question. And, and and you know, I like to think that um, things have or are evolving uh, from where they were in 2016, 2017, in large part because of role models like Stephanie. Steph, you'll love this. I was uh, I was um, hearing a presentation from a group of women uh, who were taking a course at Rotman who were returning to the workforce. So just a fabulous program for, for women executives to, to kind of come back in after taking time off with family. And one woman who's, who's you know, um, well, I'll say not 20, uh, is uh, <laughs> has a family and kids. Um, she, she said, you're a role model to her because of, of, of what you've done with your business. And so I think, you know, in part, seeing women like Stephanie, um, who aren't technical, right? I mean, stuff like, have you written a line of code? I don't think you have, right? Um, but code. <laughs> <laughs> they won't let you know that. So, <laughs> but the, the fact that you have the business idea, the business insight, uh, and, and it's from deep domain expertise and understanding, um, and connection and networks, the, the, the diligence calls, um, we had the pleasure of doing on Stephanie with her early clients were all about her and her vision and her tenacity um, and what she could do. 
to really make um, a solution shine for our clients. So, so we look for, for founders who people may not see in the traditional way, uh, but who have a great business idea and who can most importantly go out and get people to join them on that journey. Um, and so I'm trying to close off my messaging. It's not working. Um, it's okay. And, <laughs> and, uh, and can join them on that journey to, uh, to kind of build us to the next level. And I think we're, we're, we're stuff. And I don't know that I knew this at the time, but where she excels, um, is on recruiting talent and, and building a really, really, you know, culture first organization, um, and having, uh, some, some people who have many, many options take that leap of faith with her and, and in her business. So, so those, those to me are a lot of traits that are sometimes overlooked in female founders. You know, the, I think Steph had some crazy feedback at one point in her journey before she met me. Um, I don't know if you want to share that uh, from, from, we suspect a, a US VC because they, you know, part of it was you didn't go to an Ivy League school and you're this and you're that. Oh, and, you know? if, if you're open to sharing that, cause I have other questions, but this is, I love to hear like, because yeah, I, I think lots of VCs get bad feedback or feedback that's oh, only yeah. relevant for them. So so give us give us it's this example. Pattern stuff. recognition, right? Yeah. If you are you open to share it? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I, if if I put myself back in their shoes, right? Like if you take a step back mm -hmm. at the time, I was so hungry and passionate about this idea, and I'm trying to convince them. We're talking five years ago, right? I I was successful at raising capital with institutional money four years ago. So there was a year, a year and a half of trying to raise capital. Um, and then you have this idea in procurement, which is not super sexy, right? People don't necessarily understand the space that well. Um, they know the players, so why is it, you know, there's software companies, how this machine learning platform, this concept of a machine learning platform five years ago was quite hard to articulate. To the investment community like it's going to get better over time right like this this yeah. something that today it's a lot of investors have now experience with data platforms um so that was a little complex and then you've got someone who has three kids who's a solo founder who has no technical experience who's never built a tech company before who hasn't gone to stanford like i've got like all the red flags <laughs> of like if I was to invest in someone like that, I think even though, you know, I, I, I believe in the idea, I think that would be a challenge because there's so much risk, right? So it's about de-risking yourself. And it was, I remember this um, investor is like, who are you, Lone Ranger, like trying to build this company by yourself? Like you'll never get capital unless you build a team. And I was like, well, I need capital to build a team. And he's like, it's going to be the other way around. And so I remember leaving that meeting so defeated because I felt like, how am I going to attract a CTO? How am I going to attract? And the lesson there is that the technology had to be in-house. And I didn't have that. I had a team that I trusted out of Montreal that was building the tech and, and justifying it, that it was not you know a headcount, that I could have flexibility. I had the expertise without hiring someone full time. And again, the investor is like, no, you need, if you're going to sell a, a tech company like a tech product you need to have the technology in-house it's all about the values and in, in, in the technology that you're building and the data that you're building and so um but i love that meeting and then i start looking for a cto and i was really fortunate to a lot of magic dust throughout this entire journey of finding the people that you need and it may be you know when you're looking to buy a white car you're seeing white cars everywhere yeah. And I don't have a white car, but I don't know why that came out. But <laughs> or when you're pregnant or you're 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 getting married, you see wedding yeah. stuff everywhere. It's probably the same as you're more acutely aware of something that you're looking for, and it's more bound to kind of land on your lap. And that's true for my entire executive team. They came at the exact moment that I needed them, and um, and that's been really special. But it's it's been I think it's being aware of it. And looking for it anyway so that when when jeff joined that's when i was able to raise capital that's when i gave also and who's jeff is that the cto the cto okay um, so yeah yeah so a couple interesting things here so it sounds like you got feedback you don't from a potential investor it seems like you don't hold it against them and it sounds like what i love is you took a couple things out of there you said basically okay your loss but i'm gonna take uh, you did take some uh, you know almost like free consulting advice to you Go own your, go get, build in house, own your own data, which I love because I think, you know, most founders are going to meet 50 or 100 investors and 95 to 98 won't invest in them. 
But I tell them always look at it as free consulting advice, and you don't have to accept it. But it looks like you took the best out of a bad situation. Um, and I want I want to get into how you recruited people. But before that, let's talk about how you know Michelle. You it looks like I think you were one of the first institutions to write a check. And so, how did you meet? What convinced both of you to work with each other? I love either either one's of your perspective on that. Yeah, so I'm happy to jump in first. And and I just put um, a quote that I wouldn't mind sharing because I think sure. it kind of summarizes how we think about things. It's a quote from Melinda Gates and you know, she pretty has a few views on this. Her quote is, when the only people giving and receiving venture funding belong to a small homogenous group, society misses out on a whole bunch of breakthrough ideas and financial opportunities. And you know, really the point is that when venture capital starts to look beyond the same small pool of founders, we'll see more innovative ideas with potential to improve the lives of more people. Um, and we'll see the next generation of business leaders who really reflect the markets they're trying to serve. Um, and in the end, at the end of their day, it's to deliver better returns to our investors, right? We, Alex, you and I have, have people who invest in us and we, yep. we have to, you know, there's, there's a food chain and we, we won't continue to be in business if we don't deliver good returns. So, um, so I really love that quote and I think about it a lot because um, you know, you're going to find really great opportunities at the edges too. And so, um, so I think with Stephanie, uh, I remember meeting her through a colleague, um, but we just kept getting connected, like by what, six, seven people, I think, Steph, and everyone's like, you guys should be talking to each other. You guys should be talking to each other. You should, you ladies should be talking to each other. And, um, have you just got to know each other. Everybody, have you met Michelle McBain? We had met, but uh, very briefly, and it just kept kept coming back to Michelle. Mm -hmm. and, then and she, sorry, she she just you know she won me over with her tenacity. I would say on a bunch of fronts, and I think you know you hit on a really great point too, Alex, around taking feedback and you know not taking it um, in a really personal way, right? It's like this is someone's opinion; it has nothing to do with you. Take it at face value. Um, I know when we talk to founders in the early days, say, you know, screening for accelerators, we we also look for founders who can not just kind of turn with all of the feedback that comes, but can take the feedback that, you know, they believe is meaningful to their business and what they're building and move forward with it. And so, you know, saw those traits in Stephanie without a doubt, right? She kept coming back and saying, okay, this is what I'm hearing from you. And so here, I've, I've dealt with this and, and, you know, I put this in front of you, let's get a deal done. Um, and she created momentum for, for her opportunity. Okay, so and I'd love to hear from your perspective, Steph, because mm -hmm. just what I'm hearing again is something we're talking about before we went live is about tenacity. And it sounds like even that first, you know, everyone has this magical moment that in the pre-seed or seed round, you meet the founder, you meet the investor and they write you a check the next day. But here's like some, you know, I don't know how long these six meetings or six encounters are, you know, but it doesn't sound like Michelle met you first and wrote a check. So what was your perception of what happened and how did you get, you know, what was going through your mind that you convinced Michelle to eventually invest? I think the really, really fast check is when your, your metrics are so through the roof, like you're having such fast growth and then investor will get on a plane without even knowing who you are. That's when it happens and consistently, which is the very, very small minority of companies, especially if you're building a new category or something that didn't exist before. Um, and so I, I do think if any investors, because we've done a few rounds now, it's it comes always with building trust with the investor. And when I met Michelle at first, listening to her feedback, leaving and then updating her on the progress that I was making, right? So I, was, I was sending her a note or can we meet again? I'd love to talk to you about what we've accomplished. Hey, we just won this customer. Hey, I just hired a team. I would love to come in and introduce you to my team. And at that point, even though I was fundraising because we needed money, it was not so much about fundraising as building the relationship there and building the trust for her to know that I had what it took to be able to deliver. Um, and uh, I'd say that the one key words that come more at the beginning is how coachable I was because I had never done this before. And so to be able to take that kind of feedback and come back and deliver, um, I think it's really important because then the investor feels that they have a lot of experience. They can, they can help you. They can guide you. If you think you know it all, they're not going to be able to have, you know, really positive impact. If you're open to their feedback, they feel that they're going to have it's not control, but they're going to be able to guide you and help you be successful. And you're going to be receptive to it. That's a big difference, especially in the early days. And, and so, okay, go on, Michelle. What I was going to say too, is um, you have to always match your investor to what you're trying to do. Right. And, and so we're, we're not, we're a high concentration investor. We're not, we're not um, 
we're not a you know small check, high volume type of investor. And so, so those checks can move a lot faster. Um, we're also an institutional investor, so we have uh, you know, despite despite trying to move as fast as we can, we are managing other people's money. So we have to be able to work through our process as well. Angels have none of that. You know, there's this great line uh, from from an angel I know, and and he's he was doing a deal, and he's like, you know, he's in Florida, and he's like, I'm gonna go walk on the beach with my wife and she's my investment committee and I'll convince her and then we can write a check, right? And and so it's just, it's that simple. So, so you know, being aware and, and I'm sure it's stating the obvious, but I think it's important to think about um, the founder or the investor and their, their, uh, their business model um, because that's going to really inform how fast things move. I will also say, you know, our thesis is that, um, our, the, the ventures we invest in at the seed stage are still a bias because as Stephanie said, there's not the KPIs and the metric and the growth rate. And so we work really closely with companies to get them to those series A milestones. And, and most companies in our portfolio have gone on to raise a large series A. And so, so that's, been, that's been a good metric to do, but, but we really work at that stage where there's less information. And so for first time founders, uh, and often uh, the female founders are first time founders, um, the 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 data is not there. The bias isn't there. We have deals that we know in the city where second time founders have basically raised funding, you know, on a PowerPoint, um, and so that's again a different scenario as well. So so we hear all these stories, Alex, to your point, but you have to unpack them a bit uh, just to fully understand um, what each situation is. I, I love the advice there um, and the insight there because I do think what, what who gets a ton of attention out there in the web are these very active super angels that are writing a hundred checks a year. They're like, yeah, I meet with the person. I'm going to write a check. And you know, that's their model. And they're also writing a hundred checks. So they need like, they're hoping that five provide all the return. And it's, it's, it's a different business model. I think most people don't understand that. I, I want to just a couple more questions about this. And I want to get about growing the company and how you've worked after that round. So Steph, were you informed, were you keeping all the investors you met up to date or do you select a subsection of investors that you wanted to work with? Well, at the beginning, when I started fundraising, I had no idea what it was all about. And so I was meeting everyone. And I didn't know it was, there was a different stage. I didn't know to ask questions about the size of the fund, the stage of the fund, where they invested, what their thesis. Like, I just met everyone. Um, so then I was very selective about who would I learn over time. Like, the stage is so important and the investment thesis is so important. Even in the round we just completed, we met God knows, like maybe 40 different funds because it was all Zoom, so we could. Yeah. And um, I'd say out of that, there's five that we're now having monthly check-ins. And so five that I it did just, they understood the the model. They had more conviction. They were interested. And like we moved really fast getting the term sheet. Some decided that we were a little too early for, for them because we did raise a few quarters earlier and others just didn't have the time to do the diligence, but they wanted yeah. to stay connected for the next round. So uh, and that's that's about appropriate. Like five, I would say five to eight funds to stay connected with. Otherwise, you could have a newsletter that kind of yeah. is more broad. But building that relationship is just time consuming, and you're only going to have one fund that's going to lead your next round. I forgot you did that step too. You did do that really well through through you know when when we were going through our process, and and I could tell it was always a personalized note, right? It wasn't a newsletter, and I think a newsletter is important. Um, and, and something to think about for, for a broader audience for different reasons, right? Could be for new customers, could be for clients, for anything, for recruiting. Um, but you always took the time to personalize, fine tune it. And, 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 and if people didn't quite understand what you said here, you're now also keeping for your next round four to five key investors that you identified in this round really close to you so that, you know, when you, you kick off the process, it, it will just seem like a natural extension of your conversation. You're going you're gonna to be able to gauge too if it's the right time, right? Because yeah. then you can talk to them about where you're at and does it feel right? And if they, you're starting to feel the momentum, then you have to feed on that. And then you can bring other funds because it may be a completely different fund that's going to come and give write you a check, right? But it's a, it's a good way to gauge if you're ready. I, I like that what you said, feel the momentum. Um, just for the audience, uh, you know, if you have any more questions about this subject or any subject, just put them in there. Liz will uh, bring them up to us. Uh, so you raise that round, and then uh, you know, what commitments did you make to each other? Because Michelle, like unlike an angel, you said you're high, you know, 
high commitment, highly involved. And Steph, I imagine there was some things you were looking. So I'm sure was was it just capital or was it an agreement saying, okay, now we're writing this check. This is what we're going to do. Um, yeah, I'd say that was it. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm as involved as a founder wants me to be. If we invest in a founder who knows exactly what they want to do, then we'll just do our our kind of check-ins and uh, add value where we can and identify, you know, opportunities we can bring through our network. But but with Steph, it was really, um, you know, I'm going to call it a partnership. We worked really, really closely together through some, you know, my old partner used to call venture investing a roller coaster, right? Some highest of highs and lowest of lows. And sometimes they're on the very same day or in the same hour. So, you know, we, yeah, I tried to be there for, st I tried to be someone for stuff that she could call with any question um, or deliver any news, good or bad, and just kind of stay constant through that and, and try and build the trust and, and, you know, I think I think we were successful there. I think that's the best the best kind of relationship you can have, where you can just be as open and transparent and candid um, about about where things are at. In in of course a very respectful way. I'm, I'm not a bang on the table type VC. So um, so I think we all we all and the other piece we try and do at the seed stage is you can't you know like stuff's putting some amazing processes in place now there's no way you can do that at the early stage right it's like it's like an onion where okay let's let's try to get a good board agenda together <laughs> let's try to do this or do that and here are the frameworks we see but but we're very conscious that you can't layer all of that all at once on a small team you're a team of 10 people and at the end of the day we just you know want you to build a product and get some clients um and so that's my long-winded answer to to kind of my where I sat. And, and Steph, what were you hoping for, and what did you get? I mean, I don't know how Michelle does it because I literally feel like she's so on top of what we're doing. She's always available. She picks up the phone. She's got all these other founders that she's making herself as available as she is to me. And I just don't know how she does it. And she's looking at you know new investments and meeting other founders. And she's involved in a million different things. Um, I do feel really fortunate that I had someone that really believed in, in me and the company early on and, and nothing has phased her throughout because like, we've had a lot of ups and downs and crazy times. Um, and she just is very always calm and just rational. Um, and it's just like, yeah, you know, this is this is happens. And and so um, but I think to me it was that kind of comfort and someone that could guide that understood the landscape and understood um, exactly what Michelle said, the appropriate time, how to introduce better processes and how to introduce a more formality. Like we were really informal when Michelle started on our board. It was, you know, four of us and we literally showed up with coffee and chatted. And, and as you kind of become more mature, especially as we start looking at bringing an independent and then you kind of want to step up a little bit um, to that. Now we've got two rounds with lead investors that are, um, you know, more, I'd say more sophisticated or more, more advanced, right? Like we needed to really different stage, different stage. Exactly. And so Michelle has been there through the whole thing. And I feel like as you know, my board member, she's got my back. She knows me personally. Right. And she, I, and there's a lot of comfort to translate like the, the new investors um, and their way of thinking, which is so valuable to the earlier stage investor that's still there. Um, it's sort of a, you know, kind of a nice, Comfort and Michelle's super connected, and she's been so helpful in many ways. So all of that, like, is never shy of sending us information that could support the team or me or personally. Or well, I can tell you just from the outside that Michelle is a super advocate for all our companies. Like, she she has no hesitation to call me say, "Hey, Alex, I have my pom -pom. This. <laughs> You know, she she and she's a fair advocate too. She's not going to go say, "Hey, this company's like going to be the next Uber." She's saying this company's made good progress. They're growing. You know, you should look at them. Um, Going to get to some questions from our audience. I've got to see a few of them. I think I'm going to go two to around the fundraising, and I think two I'll go to the next subject I want to touch on. So a question from Mila. She says, Michelle, Stephanie, in the absence of a warm intro, what is your favorite cold approach? So I guess that's for to an investor. Oh, that's a great question. Um, hmm. Let me think about that. Can you ask another question? Yeah, and Steph, do you have an answer for that? Thoughtful in that? Yeah. Did you do any cold outbounds to uh, investors? Sounds like you did. I did in the earlier days a ton, a ton. Um, anything work well? 
I didn't get money from those. Okay. So, <laughs> so we'll think about that question, money. Mila, and we'll come back to if anyone has great ideas. Like, I, I, I always say there's a way to, again, maybe I'll just might jump in here. I, I always try to go find, if, if you have a rationale to being reaching out to an investor, it's usually someone else in their portfolio, and it might be easier to try to meet, find someone in their portfolio or someone they're connected to. The problem is it's not a fast process because they should actually be, because the worst thing is someone says, hey, Alex, I see you know, Michelle, can you introduce me? And then I do an introduction. Michelle goes, okay, what do you know this person? If I don't know him uh, or her, uh, it's hard for me to give. But if I, if someone says, hey, Alex, I'm thinking of raising in three months. I see you know Michelle. I'd love to get you to get to know me so maybe you can introduce me. Like if there's, you know, but, so there's one tip. I can give you one tip that cool. I think it, it can be interesting. So there was a fund that I really liked, uh, NFX, that was more about sort of the, the network effect in San Francisco. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't remember how I ended up getting a meeting with them, but I was following their blog and I did use to send a message. I think his name was Jim. I did use um, a quote from one of his blog posts around defining what we were working on and wanting to have the opportunity to meet him just to be able to pick his brain. So it was not like I was not pitching him. I was saying, I'm going to be in Menlo Park. You know, this resonates. This is what we're building in this space. Would love to meet. And he gave me half an hour, right? So I, I, I'm trying to remember if that was it or someone else made the introduction, but it got me a meeting. So there's ways, but I think you have to make it really personal and you can't just sort of send a blanket email like about your company because they get thousands, right? Yeah, so it, it goes back to what Michelle said about not just sending a generic, yeah. it's customizing the approach. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, you know, we see signals too, right? And so if I start hearing about a venture, uh, a lot like Stephanie, right? Like I kept hearing about Stephanie and Tealbook and, and her as a founder. And um, I jokes don't like I was looking to invest in a business that had clients in procurement. But, um, but you know, we, we look at the founder and what they're doing and, and we're B2B enterprise. So, so if you start hearing a lot about um, what someone's doing and you see their name and like I'm on Twitter, I'm on LinkedIn, you know, Clubhouse is starting to be, a, I'm trying to figure Clubhouse out. I think it's fascinating. Um, I think it's and, for people with no kids. <laughs> Well, well, yes and no, because everything's PST, so I kind of <laughs> do it late at night. But um, there, there's building your name and your brand that way is also really neat because it's, it's, you know, some of the social signals. At the end of the day, it's all the social signals that you're trying to, to kind of elevate. Um, because we think about this a lot too, right? So, so, so not all founders have, you know, um, and, and don't take this the wrong way, folks from UCC, but don't have a UCC network that they can use to kind of get to to X, Y, Z, you know, um, investor, corporate person, and all those sorts of things. So, um, so we do we do meet founders who aren't preferred. We will absolutely do that. Um, and 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 that's our thesis. Other funds won't do that. They'll demand that you have a referral in. Um, and so, so just elevate, elevate the social signals around your business, I think are a pretty neat way to do it. So I think this will be a quick question. This is from Marilyn, basically asking, Hey, Canadian startup looking to see is, uh, for seed funding. It's better to be incorporated in Canada or us, Delaware advantages, disadvantages, any quick thoughts there? Yeah. I mean, talk to your lawyer would be my first piece, but, um, uh, so if you're going to, uh, raise funding in Canada, many of us. Uh, have to invest in the parent company. So, uh, and that means it needs to be a CCPC. So we want to invest in the top co, um, you know, most companies will have a sub that's US. Um, so, so it, you know, it, it, it's a hard question to answer super quickly because there's pros and cons to both. But if you think you're going to invest, uh, you're going to seek investors who are Canadian-based investors, then uh, you should do that. Steph raised money from U.S. investors, and it, it doesn't matter. Um, the, all the U.S. or global investors will invest in a Canadian company. Um, you know, we, we can talk about the advantages to being a CCPC and all those sorts of things. But I, I feel like I need to do a talk to your lawyer kind of this Yeah, I, I, I would agree there. Um, now, I guess I got a question from Kai and Maud, which are very similar, basically asking Steph, how do you find your co-founder slash how do you find your CTO? And I'll, I'll even make that more broad. Like Michelle said, your superpower is finding the right people. So A, tell us how you found the CTO and convince them to join. And then how do you go about recruiting these experienced people like that, you know, may have not known they don't want to join Tealbook? 
I mean, a CTO, I was interviewing, uh, I hired a recruiter initially who was introducing me to CTOs. Um, they understood the problem. I just didn't have the technical experience to be able to gauge if they had the right experience or not. So that was really difficult. Um, then you have to convince them that procurement and supplier data is something that's like, you know, it should be sexier than other things that are being done in Toronto. So it was that. Um, and I met Jeff through, it was a firm that heard that I was looking for um, a CTO and I'd heard that Jeff's company, where he was before, um, was acquired. And so uh, she says, hey, you know, I've got this guy and I think he may actually come with some capital and maybe the team. And so him and I met and it was very serendipitous because his experience had been at IBM and then at Ariba, which is an e-procurement software he had been there for 10 years and then he had gone to Scout Lab, did a second master's in computer sciences at UFT and machine learning, did a stint at Google. And it was like all these things that he had done in his career that was leading to understanding the opportunity, the size of the opportunity, and that he had the right skill set to be able to build the data team and the uh, application. And so that was really serendipitous. Um, and then he came with an executive, the CEO of the company that got acquired. I got him. Uh, as a COO at the time. And so that gave me two people that had the, the experience to building software, the company and the building the technology. And uh, that gave a lot of confidence to investors that I had two serious, you know, um, experienced uh, executives. And then through the rest of the journey, honestly, it's uh, a lot of, a lot of the time, I, I, I'd say I've probably known to taking a chance on people and so if I think of my uh, head of like now is chief strategy and revenue officer, he's never done that role, but he had been in a company that got acquired by Coupa. He was part of the executive team, smart, uh, hardworking, had good instincts, knew the space. And he's the one who reached out to me when we were, when we're at a point where if we we're going to continue on that path, we would have not become sustainable. Like we would have, our growth would have not sustained because uh, we appeared as a software company and he just reshifted how we articulate the value proposition around being the data platform that powers all the software. So he was very, very much responsible for that pivot. Um, so he joined my head of uh, customer success was uh, doing digital procurement transformation at Rogers and before that American Express, L'Oreal. And so we had coffee. It was just really networking. And then she's talking about what she loves to do is impact businesses and its trans transformation. And talk about the impact she would have at Tailbook. And I had a gut feeling she would be incredible. She's very operational. And, um, and so it's, it's sort of, you know, the only ones I've been through a recruiter is the ones I really don't know much about, like VP of finance with FPNA experience. I just didn't know enough about what good looked like. And so I hired um, Clarity Recruiting to find that person. And that was awesome. And we're going through that with like a VP of engineering right now. So there's, there's certain skill set where if I'm not, if I don't know enough about the capabilities required, then I'll go through a more formal process. But for the most part, everyone else kind of fell in my lap exactly at the time that I needed them. So I, uh, I'm sorry, I have a quick comment about that. <laughs> they didn't fall in your lap. <laughs> they, so Steph has done an incredible job. I encourage everyone to follow her on LinkedIn because she has established herself as such a thought leader um, through that platform in particular, I think more so than than some of the others. And and when I think of your head of sales, he um, he got to know you, if you will, by following you know your 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 sharing and your documents and everything um, through LinkedIn. So I think that's how, in part, he initially reached out, and you of course developed a relationship from there. But um, just overall presence, the way you can amplify your business, and and I think Tealbook always um, looked like it was much bigger than it was too, um, well, by well, using some of those platforms, right? Yeah. So so just I want to summarize. What I heard two things: brand your company and yourself, and also I heard something which I heard from early Shopify days. I don't hear this as much anymore. Invest in people who have the potential. So not not someone that's done before, but someone that's done impressive things before, but could do it. Um, look. I'm loving this conversation. I feel like I go another an hour and a half, but Liz is telling me it's almost one o'clock, which I didn't realize. So I'm going to ask two other questions um, and then maybe we'll have to do some follow-up another time. Uh, so what, a year ago, I'd be asking people, hey, how's COVID impacting your business? And usually it was a worry, but like, I think COVID has been an, excel an accelerant for you, Stephanie. So tell me how COVID's impacted your business and, and, you know, and then as a follow-on so I'm doing a two-part one question so I don't get in trouble. Um, how has COVID impacted your business? And then you, I know you've done a recent raise. 
what's been the impact for your relationship with Michelle, with Michelle and also just overall with the company? Um, all right. So with COVID, um, so we raised money, we raised 5 million last year. And so we had a US VC called Refinery Ventures who led that round. Workday Ventures came in, which gave us a lot of credibility, Grand Ventures as well. Michelle um, did a follow one and BDC came in that round too. <clears throat> and so we already had some proof point that with this new pivot, the messaging was landing well in the market. And it was a bit of a G-force movement right now that was happening in our space. Um, we started kind of planning 2020 with conferences and having customers on stage and suddenly COVID hit. And so the first reaction was to scale back spend. Let's like, let's wait out. But within a week, we decided to go to market and announce to the market that we're going to give supplier lists for any organization disrupted by COVID in their supply chain. And we got 170 requests in the first three weeks. We got picked up in Forbes twice. Like it was like this suddenly this momentum that was created uh, because every organization, private or public sector, was struggling with finding suppliers even to buy PPEs or shifting their production. Or so we helped FEMO, WHO, uh, or FEMA, WHO, the Red Cross, uh, Brooks Brothers was able to source probably propylene from us and all the different ingredients to make N95 masks. So it was like this massive kind of reactive uh, moment in the industry. And what our customers realized is that they had spent millions of dollars in these software to spend, to, you know, to manage spend, but that was not helpful when it came down to like accessing all the suppliers in your supply base that may be able to ensure business continuity or had the capacity to be able to provide the type of materials or services that you needed um, fast enough, let alone go to market to be able to reshore your supply base and things like that. So you kind of saw movement. Then Black Lives Matter companies came out and say, we care about supplier diversity. We want to give opportunities to Black-owned businesses. How many suppliers do we do business that are Black-owned, you know, certified? And so, so suddenly organizations are looking for this data and we're able, we had all the infrastructure and the data to be able to serve that market. Um, I, I, you know, it's, uh, I mean, it's still a complex sale because we're changing a mindset, but we're able to use that to lift our brand, lift the importance of supplier data. And the other big impact is all the software providers that were promising good data through software could not deliver on this good data. And so they came to us to ask if we could integrate. So suddenly we had this pipeline of software wow. partners. So in terms of revenue, we did okay last year, but we grew the pipeline. We signed some really strategic partnerships um, and, and, then, and then learned a lot about our business. And that's, Really, when the and then we got positioned in the market by as a data foundation to this entire digital e procurement market by one of the top firms, AT Kearney. And suddenly, it's sort of like the momentum of that every investor was reaching out, and it felt very much like what happened two years ago with blockchain and the investment community. Like supply chain data was like the hottest thing on the market, and so we we leveraged that in August. I looked at the at the market to see. Should we go out and raise? And we we met with a couple of funds, got some feedback. We knew that we had a little bit more work to be done in our data room to kind of just address some of the things up front. And we also put, which I love and I recommend everyone to do, is put your investment thesis up front. Like why you, why is it, what's what's happening in the market right now? Um, what what ma will make you competitive? What analogy can you, without being, you know, using that as your front line, but yeah. what other analogy can can you compare your business to? And that thesis should kind of stay along all your, your rounds. Um, and the other thing we did is we put four milestones that we wanted to achieve. So we were talking to investors about these four milestones. And we said, if we hit those milestones, at least two out of the four, we're going to launch the process the first week of October. So as soon as we close Q3, we'll know. And one of that was se closing seven deals that we had. And those were big companies like Goldman Sachs, Freddie Mac, right? Wow. Big companies. And then we needed to close one of the strategic partnerships, which we did. As soon as that happened, then we went back to investors like, hey, we hit these two milestones. We're ready to go. And we launched a process and we got a term sheet in four weeks. And so COVID was definitely a huge accelerator. And my relationship with Michelle hasn't changed. Like she's I think she's more kind of proud because now I'm growing up and, you know, the, the team is growing up and we've got investors that are coming in and more board members. And um, but her input and her involvement has stayed the same. And uh, and then we're learning with new investors what they care about, how they want to, you know, how what do they want to see in a board meeting? How do they get involved at what level where they're a good fit? And we're just going to learn how to find strike that balance again with someone new on the board. It's like adding someone on your executive team. Like you just need time to digest, get to know each other and see how you maximize 
that 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 person because we have a board board that is across so many fantastic level of experience and background so how do i use them as best as possible to help us guide our business is my philosophy on how we drive that board michelle anything to add here i see um i would say i think you know i was thinking of a a call we had yesterday um with with some of the board members and and what i can bring now is continuity in in history right so so as a new board member is coming up to speed and say well here's the background of why we did things this way and and they're like oh okay so so it just speeds up that conversation around why certain decisions were made at, at different inflection points so um um, I, Steph, I'd love to ask you the two, three pieces of advice you gave a founder in, in our portfolio who's starting to fundraise now. Sorry. I because just want I to think, say one thing before that. I, I want to hear that advice. No you, no, you can ask that question. I want that question. But I just want to give a shout out to Steph because before we start, mm. start us the live stream, we we're going to talk about her tenacity. But one thing I just heard is you went from six months for that first round to completely dominating and doing a four-week round. And what it's impressive there is if you've just like what I'm hearing from this is your ability to learn and just take control of stuff. And I just gotta say, like, I gotta give you a shout out. That's amazing. Now Michelle to ask your questions before I just want to get that contextually right. You know, Alex has known me at the beginning. Like we met when I was, you know, still yeah. We'll do a shout out to Angel Lesbian, you know, being a big part when of When I it. still had hair. Um, <laughs> no, I never had hair. Um, Michelle, what was the question you were gonna ask? Yeah, just the one or two pieces of advice you gave a founder recently. Um, and and I think the Zoom world uh, changes the fundraising process right now. So my dog also wants to participate. Oh my God, I don't even know what I said to Shelby. Um, or is it Marie? I think, I think is it with Marie, I, I, I was talking about that investment thesis and I think those milestones, how do you set milestones that you can achieve? That was the the one thing that I think she took away. Um, because if you have milestones that you can achieve, you can sort of show progress and get investors to see, to hear the momentum. So, you know, don't put something that's so aspirational that you can't hit it. Right. But don't put something that's also insignificant that they wouldn't get impressed. But if you say, Hey, you know, when this happened, this is when we're going to launch the process. Does it feel right to you? And then they go, yeah, that feels pretty right to me. And you're hoping that one of them will give you a preemptive term sheet and you don't have to even raise it all. But it had almost happened, but in our data room, we had the way that we had um, report churn looked like our churn was actually really high when it wasn't. And that investor, you know, it's it, it, talk about timing. That investor was like literally chasing me to write a check as fast as possible. They asked, they looked at that churn document, they asked questions, and it took us another week and a half to get back to them with like the right data. Cause we hadn't done any data room yet. So we had to kind of re- refigure how to communicate that churn by that time, two deals landed on their lap and then they had no bandwidth, right? Like you lost within a week and a half because we didn't have the right data in front of them. That would have been a preemptive uh, round if we had taken that money. Anyway, in the end, like we're super happy with RTP global and Jules coming on the board. So it all worked out, but uh, just sometimes it's not about even you. It's about the bandwidth and what they're, you know, what they're doing right now that may um, interfere with them investing in you. So there's a lot of different factors you have to think about. And Michelle, if there's something I'm missing that I said to someone that you want me to, I, I think I think it was the imposter syndrome, right? Just um, I think that really resonated um, with one founder. I mean, I don't what you said. I, I, yeah. Like if, if or she said you got her over her imposter syndrome. Like if this guy can do it, why can I not do it? Like what's <laughs> making that guy be a founder of a tech company that's now worth a billion dollars? Like I can do that. <laughs> I, 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 I love that. I think we'll we'll end there. Um, Steph and Michelle, thank you so much for your time. And I actually want to do follow, you know, follow up, you know, Steph, if I can get you away from your company again, is to talk about the challenge of scaling. Cause we got into just like the early stages. Like, and I know you're going from, I think it was 25 to 55 people right now. And that just boggles my mind. So um, thank you so much for your time. I may be uh, sending you another email to get some more time. And I think the audience here is going to just, has just loved it. Um, and yeah, I'm just grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks. Nice to see you, Alex. Yeah, Thanks. Great, great to see you. Um, if you love this, uh, we have a lineup of great programming happening in the next few weeks. Uh, the first thing we have is we have uh, Farhan. Uh, you know, I don't know if you've heard of him. He's at Shopify. He's been around this ecosystem forever. He is 
brutally honest. He talks 10 times faster than me, and we're having a, basically a Q&A social night for insiders. So become a TechTO insider before the 25th and join it. You'll, you will absolutely love it. The next thing we're doing is we're, uh, we're if you're announcing a raise this year, we're hosting a limited seating roundtable with the PR experts from TalkShop Media. Uh, this is about creating a media strategy to get the attention you want. Uh, as limited capacity uh, event. So if you're interested, act fast and email Liz right there. So a couple of great things. We have a bunch of other great things coming up. Um, you know, if you we have a lot of always inside. If you like this and you want to learn about how to pitch, we have a thing called Perfecting the Pitch where we get in, tech to insiders together. We get one to pitch. We get two or three angels around the room and we give feedback. It's the community is here to help you build your pitch and help you be successful. And that's the focus of Perfecting the Pitch. Uh, last, we'll be back on March 19th with Shruti Gandhi from AirAVC. And Shruti's just a genius. Like, a, you know, she, I think she teaches machine learning at Columbia, if I remember correctly. She's going to bring on a founder called Champ Bennett from Capsule Video. And they're going to basically, you should be able to register right now at TechTO. And if you have any other recommendations for founders or funders that we should have on, please tweet them at me. You can use, you know, hashtag TechTO. You can use my LinkedIn, which I think, it, I mean, my uh, Twitter, which is Alexander Norman, or you can use uh, TechTO uh, on Twitter, or you can actually do it on LinkedIn. Finally, if you if you have some time, you want to meet people from the community, we're going to keep up, keep open networking till about 1.45. So that's 45 minutes to meet other people from the ecosystem. Be kind, get to know them. Don't be transactional. And don't do anything you wouldn't do with your family. Uh, thanks.